nonprofit uh, have a mission of improving lives worldwide through excellence and innovation in CBT training, practice, and research. Um, and of course, we have our Center for uh, Recovery-Oriented Cognitive Therapy that you'll be hearing a lot about tonight as well. Um, during the pandemic, we feel um, a huge amount of responsibility for living into that mission, not just in the US or not even just in Philly, but around the world. Um, and uh, our, our business is growing, our team is growing, um, and there's a lot that you'll be hearing from us in the months to come. But for tonight, we obviously have so much to celebrate. Um, here's a brief agenda uh, for you. Uh, first, we'll hear from briefly from Judy and she'll introduce Dr. Aaron Beck. Um, after Dr. Beck, um, we're going to hear um, from Paul and Ellen, who will be talking about the book. We get a chance to hear from Rich Busis, our board chair, who will make a toast. Uh, there's going to be some Q&A, and then we'll have a chance uh, for everyone to wish congratulations at the end. Um, it's about 10 of 6. I think we'll be done around 6.30 Philadelphia time. And I'm going to uh, turn the program over to Judy. Um, before I do that, I just want to say how proud we are of Judy. She's an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary teacher, an extraordinary psychologist. Um, and I'm so glad that she's ours. So Judy, you want to take it from here? Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the third edition of Cognitive Behavior Therapy Basics and Beyond in just a moment. But first, I'd like to uh, turn over the floor to Dr. Aaron Beck, my dad, who at the age of 99 is still working, still passionate about his work in recovery-oriented cognitive therapy and still expounding new theories, it seems, um, with refinements every day. So um, Dan, you had a few things you wanted to say to the group? So I wanted to say that I second everything uh, that uh, Lisa Pope said about you. And Thank also, you. Lisa's been doing a terrific job in expanding and integrating the uh, Institute of Cognitive Therapy, uh, Cognitive Behavior Therapy. Uh, the people might be interested in a little background uh, 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 as to just how the uh, Institute came into existence. Uh, and so many years ago, back in the 1960s, I started to uh, uh, treat depressed patients uh, at the university. And pretty soon, I, the residents wanted to know about this newfangled treatment, which was called cognitive therapy. And I then subjected cognitive therapy to a variety of research programs. Uh, I would say that basically, I was a researcher, but now these bases have expanded. So I would say now I'm a clinician and an experimentalist and, uh, and a theoretician. In any event, uh, uh, we went from one condition to another. Uh, we went to anxiety and then suicide and uh, so on. And each time we would start off by treating some patients uh, and then developing various measures of the disorder. And then finally, uh, we would do a clinical outcome trial so that uh, it would prove uh, that the, uh, the therapy was efficacious. Now, after 25 years of doing this, I really got tired of uh, uh, running the training program uh, as well as doing the research. And so the at that particular point, Dr. Judith Beck was already in shape to take over the clinical operation. 
uh, and it just seemed best to separate off the clinical operation from the research operation. And therefore, the uh, Beck Institute uh, was established. I believe at the beginning, uh, I was president of the Beck Institute, but in short order, Judy became president. Now, Judy uh, has done a number of books uh, which uh, introduced the, uh, <clears throat> the clinician to cognitive therapy and her most recent volume, uh, which is the third edition of cognitive behavior therapy and beyond, uh, uh, really has expanded to a terrific degree and it, it, it uh, will serve its place as the primer on CBT. Um, so Judy is to be congratulated for her work. And then uh, following up on my research interest, I became interested in research in schizophrenia on the basis that it was unknown whether cognitive therapy had any impact on uh, schizophrenia. Uh, and it was at that time believed and it's still generally believed that the schizophrenics have certain deficits in their um, makeup, in their mind, uh, that they have cognitive deficits, uh, which uh, is account for their uh, very poor performance uh, on tests and in the real world. To our amazement, uh, Paul and then Ellen and I found out that the, uh, these deficits were due to dysfunctional beliefs. And so uh, the idea was if you could correct the dysfunctional beliefs, uh, that the people would function better. Uh, we then discovered that the usual method of using reason against the dysfunctional beliefs did not work. What did work was positive, uh, was positive activity on the part of both the therapist and the patient. And Paul and Ellen will go more into that in detail. And this was a real turnaround and uh, it, uh, it eventuated in our getting called from various states and we have now uh, introduced our training programs on what we now call cognitive therapy, uh, uh, recovery oriented cognitive therapy or CTR. And so Paul and Ellen will tell you about that. And I do want to congratulate the various authors of the book uh, uh, but uh, in particular, Paul and Ellen did a lion's share in bringing the book about and in writing the book and then uh, also adding all of the materials that the uh, uh, publishers required. So now I will hand the microphone back to you guys and let you carry on from there. Wonderful, thank you for those really kind remarks. I uh, started talking about um, the, uh, the second edition of Cognitive Behavior Therapy Basics and Beyond. And as soon as it was published, I started to take notes on what, the, what should be in the third edition. Um, for the first two editions, they were translated into over 20 languages. And I hope that this third edition will be as well. The most common feedback that I got about the second edition was that um, the patient I used as the example throughout both editions, Sally, was just too easy. She was a college student. She was very straightforward. And people found that in real life, their patients were much more difficult. 
So for this third edition, we have a different patient, Abe, who's also based on a real client whom I treated uh, a few years ago. But this time, Abe is middle-aged. He's uh, been severely depressed for over two years. During that time, he got divorced. He's very isolated. Mostly he sits on the couch in his very tiny apartment, feeling completely hopeless, like a failure, completely out of control. So you learn about Abe throughout the book. Uh, there are transcripts throughout the book that illustrate the conceptual techniques and the treatment techniques that I describe. I also have, in addition to the traditional case conceptualization diagrams in this book, I have a, a new strength-based conceptualization diagram. And you can watch entire therapy sessions, download uh, worksheets and diagrams and other resources on a companion website. Another change in the book is that I've incorporated techniques from a whole host of other psychotherapeutic modalities that are evidence-based. So you'll see techniques from dialectical behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, gestalt therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and so on. And, and then I'd like to talk about one final change in the book, which has really transformed my work with all of my patients at the Beck Institute, and that is the recovery orientation that my dad was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, you know, one of the ways that I have changed is that during the evaluation, I get patients to talk at length about when was their best period in their life? What was that like? What were they like? What were their strengths, their uh, personal qualities, um, their um, talents, their, and also how did they deal with challenges during that time? And then what did all of these things show about them? What did it show about their ability to form connections? What did it say about their competence and their ability to take control of their life, their ability to overcome their difficulties and so forth? At the beginning of treatment, I also ask patients to talk about what's most important to them in life, what, what some of their core values are and their aspirations, their big hopes and dreams for themselves and for their lives. And then throughout treatment, we connect with the, the work that we're doing to their aspirations and their values. At every session, I help them track their sense of well being, not just their negative symptoms, but really their sense of well being. At the beginning of every session, we spend a fair amount of time talking about some of their positive experiences. When were they at their best in the previous week? What did they get done on their action plans? When were some better times during the week or times when they felt even a little bit better? I have them visualize these positive experiences and, and try to um, get some of that good feeling right in the therapy session itself. And then I help them draw conclusions. Uh, I'll just give you a fast example. I was working with a depressed woman whose name is Mary. She concluded that she had showed her confidence this past week. I just talked to her yesterday by helping her daughter with her homework. She showed her lovability when she was hugging her children and reading to them. She showed that she was in control every time she got out of bed before 10 in the morning. Uh, she also persevered filling out her insurance forms. And I asked her how she had gotten herself to do those two very difficult things, getting out of bed and filling out these insurance forms because I really wanted to help her identify and then re reinforce the importance of these adaptive coping strategies she was using. And then instead of focusing on problems from the past week, I asked Mary uh, what she wants to put on the agenda, what goals she has for the session. And then we identify the steps she wants to take this week uh, to fulfill these goals, and we look at the obstacles that could get in the way. And then we use our just regular CBT kinds of techniques to help her resolve these obstacles, to solve problems sometimes, to um, modify her interfering thoughts and beliefs, and uh, sometimes to do skills training. 
And uh, I'm really happy to say that this recovery orientation has made me a much more competent therapist today than I was when the second edition of CBT Basics and Beyond came out. Beyond came out and I've incorporated this into the third edition. Finally, I just have a lot of people to thank. So first and foremost, thanks to um, my husband, Rich, who has uh, taken over our household and our lives while I was um, writing this revision. Thanks, of course, to my dad for all of the work that he's done in CBT and recovery-oriented cognitive therapy and being so generous with his supervision and support through the years. Um, my mom is my biggest fan, so thank you, mom, <laughs> for everything that you do for me. I wanted to thank Seymour Weingarten and Guilford Publications for sponsoring this launch event and my editor, Kitty Moore at Guilford for all her help through the years. Lisa for taking over the running of the Beck Institute in large part while I was doing the revision. Sarah Fleming um, provided innumerable hours of um, editing help for me. Uh, Ivy McDaniels and the communication staff built the companion website and have promoted the books uh, and um, have arranged for the book launch tonight. And I also just wanted to thank all of the clinicians and the staff at Beck Institute for everything they do every day. And now, Lisa, back to you. Thanks, Judy. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Paul Grant and Dr. Ellen Inverso. Um, I can remember, uh, we talked briefly before everybody got on. I can remember when Dr. Beck introduced the possibility of us uh, taking on the recovery-oriented program from Penn. Uh, it feels like a lifetime ago, honestly, and, and it was a long time coming. And it's one of those things that even then, none of us really knew how transformative it would be um, to bring the entire CTR team into the Beck Institute. And I have to say that I honestly believe that the possibilities here in terms of difference making are endless. And it really is uh, because of Paul and Ellen, and I, I also just wanna briefly acknowledge the rest of the team that are with us tonight. I know there are quite a few of them on as well. I just, um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to, to do this work with them. And I'm gonna turn the microphone over to, to them so they can talk a bit about the book. Thanks Lisa, <clears throat> really appreciate that. Um, so, you know, it's funny, we have a team, a big team, and then there's a lot of people on this call that know a little bit about CTR, but it actually began about 20 years ago, um, and there was just two of us. It was me, and I was fortunate enough to have um, Aaron Beck as, as my um, collaborator and really as my guide. Um, and we, we really wanted to, to see, as he said, can you apply these kinds of principles and really help people who historically really just haven't been able to have the life they want. They're, 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 they often are mired in institutionalization. Uh, they're, they're in, they're in, they're in uh, incarcerations, um, all kinds of things like this, or just sort of homeless on the street, that kind of stuff. Um, and you know, and the kinds of things that they exhibit often are their textbook examples of what a psychiatric condition is. So somebody who's speaking in voices, someone who's disorganized, that kind of stuff. But again, I was very fortunate to have this mentor because he said, we should learn from every single case we learn from every single session and we learn from every single consultation. So one of, the, one of the things that means is we've learned a lot and it's come a long, long way from where we started. Let me just give you an example. I think this might really illustrate it for you. Um, I have a session that, that, that we, we watch, we use for training um, and it's illustrating a chain analysis, you know, um, and uh, from a really brilliant therapist that worked with us, one of the most highly trained therapists, if I wanted to teach anybody chain analysis, especially with someone who has a lot of suspicion, this is the one I would show. Incredibly well done. So somebody who's losing attention, beautiful whiteboard usage, just going through everything, um, incredible. Now the gentleman who was being helped, he had had a horrible 24 hours. Um, he had got so upset about something he thought that happened to him um, that he blew up my phone, he blew up the therapist's phone, he blew up um, his, his psychiatrist's phone, calling all these people. He was so distressed, so distressed, so distressed. So the purpose of this analysis was to help this gentleman maybe think about alternative explanations in a certain period of time. So when the therapist finally gets to the point where he asks the guy, so 
what do you make of this? Everything we hear, what, 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 what do you think is going on here? In a very relaxed posture with a smile on his face, he said, it's good to have a friend. Not at all what the therapist was going for, but ultimately what we've learned is really what's so important because we're working with people. These are the meanings that they're missing. What's leading to this gentleman feeling paranoid and that kind of thing is actually feeling disconnected. Um, and quite frankly, there are better ways to get connection than chain analysis. And there, there, there are great ways in which you can um, you know, do it in group therapy and milieus in the world ultimately, which is what everyone wants it. Um, so these days when you would see someone that we work with, um, what they would be doing is actually realizing they were getting worked up and they would switch their energy to something that they really want to do. And I'm talking about people who might have been in a state hospital and have decades of being in their paranoid sort of states. And now they're able to switch away and live the life they want. Um, similarly, there's a, there's a famous technique um, which is called the three C's, catch it, check it, change it. Um, and we used to spend a lot of time trying to help people learn that. And even by the end, they didn't always call it by the right letters. And I don't know that it helped them that much. But what did help them is some of these experiences that drove these meanings um, that, that ultimately they say, well, I'm a good person. I'm gonna ever really use the three C's, but I'm a good person. And all of a sudden these sorts of things aren't a problem for them. So in the book, what we've done, we needed, we essentially needed a, um, we needed some, some theoretical apparatus to sort of account for um, what we were doing. It's kind of the Beck's ultimate method. He had 50 cases back at the beginning that then led to cognitive therapy, cognitive theory. So we needed, we needed, some, we needed some intellectual apparatus to catch up with what we were seeing clinically. So the first thing we needed, and this is in the book, the book's baked in with this, um, is the theory of modes. Because um, a lot of the people that we're working with, they're often in very extreme states and they're often very under, hard to understand at times, like this gentleman I was just telling you about. Um, but, um, but they aren't always like that. And I would say that by the end of that session, he was, he was really in a different thing, mode. And the theory of modes was originally developed for personality disorders to explain that the rapid changes that people might make or the suicidal mode, which was you know, the idea that someone rapidly goes into a state that could risk their life. Um, but we realized there's a positive version of this and it's called, we call it the adaptive mode. Um, and we all have an adaptive mode, what we are like at our best, that kind of thing. And that can be sort of something that we can really sort of latch onto. Um, and so we're looking how, and we now train people in the book shows you how to find that adaptive mode. Um, and then really be able to help the person grow it. So first thing is the adaptive mode, the theory of most adaptive mode. The second thing is the cognitive model. The cognitive model is so critical to what we do, but most of the work on the cognitive model focuses on negative beliefs. Why do you get stuck sort of in the people that we work with, do they ever have negative beliefs? You know, and one of the things we often say is the difference between depression and people who have our di diagnosis is generally the depressed person uh, everyone's saying, it's not as bad as you think it is. You're, you're, you're really a good person. You know, no, 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 no. And they dismiss it. Our people think those same beliefs, but the difference is a lot of the people around them also think they're not very good. They don't, they're not very hopeful for them, that kind of thing. So we need some powerful stuff. And so we realize the cognitive model has this whole other side to it. So we kind of flip it on its head. And we show you how to do that in the book. And really it's the positive beliefs about self, positive beliefs about other people and how they see you, and positive beliefs about your future. And these turn out to be what's imbued in the good activities that people are doing and ultimately the meanings that they wanna be having. So again, that gentleman who doesn't swing when somebody else swings at them, um, who's really moving up ahead, sort of activates their, these positive beliefs. Well, I, I need to go to church. I wanna be making a difference. I don't have time to mess with this, this situation. So it's really activating, learning how to activate your own adaptive mode. And so this is the basis of, of, of the book. And ultimately, we talk about how you can find it in every person, including some of the people um, that you might think of as the most disorganized, the most disconnected, um, how you can then grow that. Um, and then ultimately, um, find hope, find their sense of hope um, through what they really want to have in their lives. And then they live it. And as they draw conclusions, they begin to have a completely different life. Um, and we've seen a lot of different things like this. Maybe the last thing I'll say before handing it off to Ellen is... There's a the famous re, um, researcher and clinician, David Penn, down in down North Carolina. We once described to him some of the stuff that we were doing. He said, you know, you guys might be onto something. We do these studies because we're in a rural area. We, we drive a bus out. We pick up all the individuals. We take him in and we give them therapy for voices, therapy for persecution, that kind of thing. And we give them the bus and go back. And they always tell us we like the bus ride a lot more than we like the treatment. And so one of the things that we've really tried to do is make the treatment appealing like that. And you can get all of the goodness in there, every little bit of goodness. But it, you've got to really have something that's that really tapping into the, the, the power of the person. I'll hand it off to Alan. 
Thanks. So, uh, you know, what I just want to speak about is given all of this development and the learning that's happened over the years, and that's going to continue to happen, um, you know, the task that we had was how do we put this into a book and really help people be able to use it in the way it's intended. So I just want to share a couple of those hopes that we have with you um, and how we tried to bring that to life on paper. Um, the first thing is going to be about accessibility. Uh, so our hope is that anyone who's involved in collaborating with individuals who experience serious mental health conditions, um, be that direct care staff, nursing, peer specialists, psychiatry, social work, rec rehab, you name it, everyone in between, family members, um, will be able to pick up this book and be able to get a really great sense of understanding, but also have something really practical to take away from it. And the way that we tried to do this is we wrote everything in really plain language. We tried to give any a million different options of uh, ways that you can phrase things, so many interventions that you can pick and choose from um, based on your role, based on uh, where the person is at. We want this to be accessible to anyone of any level of education experience who uh, really just cares about uh, the individuals that, that Paul was just talking about. Um, we also are doing that through, we have a lot of examples. We open the book and teach you the model using one case example throughout, but then every challenge chapter is gonna take you through um, a different individual. And that leads me to the next thing that we want, uh, we hope that people will take away from this. And that's all about empathy and understanding. We try to give a snapshot of the inside view of a person in every single challenge chapter. So you'll see that in every chapter, it'll tell you about someone's experience, the things they might think about themselves, things they might think about what's happening around them, and uh, things that they might think about their future and the possibilities or even lack thereof that come along with their experiences. And our hope in presenting this inside view is that we might all be able to think of it a little bit about ourselves and why might I express my stress this way? What might it be that, that I would lead me to feel like I need to respond through harming myself or other people or using and, uh, you know, any number of the other ways in which stress gets expressed. And so our hope is that by really being able to tap into the humanity underneath the challenges, it'll give all of us a, a bit of a, a motivation to try something a little bit different, to tap into that best self, because we all have stress. We all express it in all the different ways. Some of them are just a little bit trickier to understand. So we want this to seem like something we can relate to. We want the most challenging things to be relatable. Um, and based on that, we'll have lots of things that we can try. So that's something we try to do. Um, and then finally, in this uh, practical kind of uh, mode that I'm <laughs> focused on right now, how, what we can really do, uh, we really want this to be used. We see this book as a playbook. We know that the individuals, the staff, the, the families, all the people who are involved in the, the care and concern for the individuals are coming from so many different settings, so many different places. And um, we all are going to need kind of to meet People where they're at, we need different pathways to follow. It's not one size fits all. So um, we hope that with the clear shared understanding, you're going to have so many things that you can flip back and forth to. And Paul and I were talking about earlier, we would love to see um, bent pages and torn seams that people feel like, you know, I've got something coming up. I can grab this book and use it and be creative and really connect and collaborate with the people that I'm working with or with my loved one, or maybe I'm going to understand just, you know, uh, the people around me even better myself. So um, I think that's kind of our, our hope for this among so many others. Um, and that, that it'll really help put recovery into action for folks. It's beyond a recovery orientation. It's about putting it on its legs and, and doing it and helping people to do it too. Um, so I, I, with that, I think we should also acknowledge some folks uh, our team was mentioned. I echo everything Judy said about the folks within Beck Institute. We have a phenomenal team, um, and many of whom are on this call. Marguerite, Nina, Francesca, um, Elisa, Shelby, Amber, Rudner, Adam, Joe. I think I got everybody <laughs> on our team um, who make this happen and bring this to life every every day um, and certainly have to acknowledge and thank our families for their support. You saw my daughter popped on, my husband's to my right listening in, my son is on the couch going to jump in when we do the cheers. 
um, Paul's wife, Amy, has been amazing. My mom's on, who's been my biggest cheerleader forever. So we're just so grateful for everyone's um, love and support because it, uh, you know, takes some work. So that's, I think some, that's where I'll pass it back. <laughs> some of our community <laughs> providers are also on. So, so all of you, to all of you, um, we really appreciate uh, yeah, we learned from so many people on this call how to do what we do. Well, I think so. Now least... the rest of the the world understands where the excitement is coming from about recovery oriented <laughs> therapy. Is the these these are these are the source for sure. Um, and I think it's my job to introduce our board chair who's going to make a toast for us tonight. I'd like to introduce Rich Busis. The Beck Institute as a nonprofit has benefited from amazing guidance in leadership over the years. Judge Phyllis Beck and now um, Rich, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa. I, I think you mostly, um, have benefited by the uh, hours of uh, pro bono legal work I've given you. <laughs> well, there's that. I am Rich Busis. I'm chair of the board of the Beck Institute. Uh, I know that we have some people uh, participating with us from all kinds of time zones all over the world. And so as the saying goes, it's 5 p.m. somewhere. And as it turns out, it's 5 p.m. on the East Coast of the United States. So whether it's uh, coffee or wine that you're gonna raise, we hope you'll be able to join us in congratulating and acknowledging these books and the people behind them. Um, first to Judy, I, I think uh, as some of you may know, it's probably not a complete coincidence that I'm chair of the board uh, since I also happen to be married to Judy. I'm not sure I ever, I feel like I'm now being described as the first husband, although I still actually uh, have a pay job. Um, Anyway, I was able to witness Judy firsthand on a daily basis and the incredible labor of love it was for her to write the third edition, which has become among other things, um, the textbook used by psychi psychiatric residents throughout the uh, United States and beyond. And the new edition was, uh, as Judy alluded to, several years in the making with hours and hours of responding to feedback and updating the text both to reflect the evolution of her own thoughts and to incorporate advances in the field, particularly the groundbreaking insights of CTR, which are evidenced in the uh, other book we're celebrating today. So countless mental health professionals around the world are gonna benefit from her wisdom, her experience, and her uncanny ability to explain compli complicated things in a way that even I can understand. And next to uh, uh, doctors Aaron Beck, Paul Grant, and Ellen Inverso on the publication of uh, Recovery-Oriented Cognitive Therapy for Serious Mental Health Conditions, what an important book you have written. And it's no surprise to me that uh, Dr. Beck, or as we call him in our house, Grandpa Tim, would publish a book. He is truly the most optimistic and energetic 99-year-old there is any place in the world. And to Paul and Ellen, congratulations on this book. The Beck Institute has been significantly enriched by you and your team joining us a mere 15 months ago. And we all know that the book will be a significant contribution to the field that will positively impact the lives of so many people. And finally, I would like to just take a quick moment to recognize the entire staff of the Beck Institute in this most challenging of years the staff has persevered, adapted to unprecedented conditions, and advanced the Beck Institute's mission in a number of areas. I marvel how you all have collectively turned lemons into lemonade, as they say. The board and I are so proud of these authors and the entire Beck Institute team. We are continuing to grow and expand our impact and will bring both CBT and CTR to more people across the globe in the years to come. And finally, I would be remiss without mentioning my predecessor as chair of the board of the Beck Institute, Judge Phyllis Beck. She oversaw the creation and the first quarter century of its existence with vision and class. Without her stewardship, 
the Beck Institute would not be what it is today, the premier institute of CBT in the world. Thank you, and let's all raise a toast and say congratulations to all of the authors and to everybody at the Beck Institute. Yay. And back to you, Lisa. Cheers. Actually, we're gonna hand this one off to Judy, I believe it's time so, for- um, Looks like, thank you. We only have a couple of uh, minutes left, but I thought I would um, ask Paul and Ellen, because this was a, a wonderful question that was submitted um, by one of the participants. But if you could only um, limit yourself to one key message that you hope the participants today would get from you, what would you say? Ah, oh, that's me, that's right. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we think that um, recovery extends to all. Everybody can can improve and get better. Some of the people that we work with sure seem like they're never going to get better. It's been too long. They're too severe, and that's that's just not true. Um, and I, I think it's it's an it's an actually a fallacy that we still run into quite a bit in our work. And and everybody can get the life that they want. And some people are just it's amazing what's in them once once you find find that once you get close to it. Um, I think that's I, a wonderful I, message. And if I can ask myself the same question. Um, I would say that learning CBT and becoming really competent in CBT really takes a lifetime. Uh, I find that every five years I have really increased my competence so much. I certainly hope I'm a better therapist five years from today um, than I am right now. So um, I hope that all of the clinicians who are participating tonight will. Um, think of what they might be able to do, maybe make some New Year's resolutions for 2021 about how to learn more, how to increase competence in CBT and help us fulfill our, our nonprofit mission of improving lives worldwide through excellence in CBT. And Lisa, I'll turn it over to you to have the last word. Okay, I'm, I have a lot of words, but I'll only say a few. Um, the first is, what an extraordinary time, right? I don't believe things happen by accident. The fact that these books are coming out during this time when this kind of wisdom is needed is just perfect in its way, I suppose. Um, and I, I just feel grateful, the, the entire Beck Institute team feels grateful to be a part of this moment for us. Um, two things. Before we close, one is that uh, if you want more information about either book, if you want more information about the Beck Institute, please write us, give us your feedback at info at beckinstitute.org. And finally, uh, I would be remiss as executive director of Beck Institute not to remind everyone that it is still Giving Tuesday. Um, in the United States, which is a time when people can contribute to the nonprofits of their choice. I know there are generous folks on this call, and I'm hoping that you'll find your way to the Beck Institute website uh, to make a donation. You can just click the donate button, and you'll know that every single dollar that's given is going to make a difference with us as, as we continue in our work. Um, so if you all want to take a minute, We'll go to gallery view and take your microphones off of mute. And just, let's just say congratulations to everyone. Congratulations. 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 Thank you. Congratulations. Well congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being with us. And we look forward to hearing from you. Have a good night. Thank good night. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.